Kia ora. I welcome you to this introduction to Mahara session today. Uh, my name is Christina Hopner and I'm the Mahara Project Lead, Product Manager and Community Facilitator working at Catalyst IT in very windy today, Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it is my pleasure today to talk with you about Mahara and portfolios and why people will be or why people are creating portfolios. But before I talk quite a bit in today's session, and you're always very welcome to put your comments or questions into the chat or also use the microphone. I'd actually like to know from you what your experience is with portfolios. So have you already used portfolios? And if so, are you using electronic portfolios? Uh, and I know some of you are already using Mahara. So if you like, either grab the microphone or uh, type in the chat, just so that we have an idea of who's in the room today. I'll go, Christina. Mm -hmm. So in my, my previous post, um, in one of the biggest colleges in Scotland before I came to Catalyst, uh, we used Mahara and elect electronic portfolios for capturing evidence for students to move on to university. We've seen that happening a lot in photography and the sort of di digital media section and also using them for assessment. There was a huge drive in Scotland from the SQA for using e-portfolios for assessment. So yeah, saw some really good practice. Mm, wonderful, Jess. Thank you so much for sharing. And if you don't want to talk and have your voice recorded, you are very welcome to type in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you for coming along, Mike, uh, Michelle, and being interested in another educational learning tool that is often used in conjunction with uh, the LMS. Good. So we actually have a really, really great group here with some people already knowing portfolios. Um, and others quite new to them. And that is a great mix. So Jess and Annalena, if you'd like to share any of your experiences with portfolios throughout the session or um, then at the end, please do feel free to do so because it's always good to hear how portfolios are being used in organizations. And for everybody else, that's why we do have this introduction to Mahara to give you an idea of what is possible with portfolios, what you can do, why you might want to use them. And um, there's no expert knowledge needed. We are, and we are also not really going into Mahara itself today because this is not a session to look at how to work with Mahara and how to drive it, but really more looking at the pedagogical um, reasons and ideas of why we want to introduce portfolios either in an educational context or also in a professional context and seeing the benefits uh, that portfolios can bring. So I did mention that I work for Catalyst and we are a company that was founded uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand over 20 years ago now. But since then, we've actually grown quite a bit and have offices around the world here in the country, also in Auckland and in Christchurch and then across the Tasman going west in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane because catalysters do like to travel and especially when they're coming from uh, New Zealand, uh, they often go and do their OE, their overseas experience. And some people like it so much that they want to live there. And that's um, pretty much how our international offices have developed, that somebody moved overseas and then um, 
at the same time that a Sydney office was opened, an office in the UK was opened as well, which is now in Brighton. And then we have an office in the EU uh, for our EU clients in Dublin. And uh, last year, we've also opened an office in Canada. And in all those locations around the world, e-learning is definitely one of our biggest service areas. In our Teroa itself, we also offer many, many more services um, around pretty much anything open source where you can also custom um, create custom applications and uh, work with a lot of government agencies to support infrastructure here in New Zealand that is all built on open source technologies. So it was kind of um, very... Oops, uh, that's always what happens when I link. Um, it was for us then in 2006 that we started working with a number of tertiary institutions here in the country who had uh, received a project grant to set up a personal learning environment, which then developed into Mahara. And so Catalyst was involved in the development of Mahara since the start and was also instrumental in suggesting that Mahara become an open source project rather than a proprietary one. So since 2006 now, we have been maintaining Mahara and are the stewards for the software bringing out security releases and um, fixing bugs and developing also the majority of the new features that you see in the platform. It has been wonderful as, uh, to be able to work with the community as team who is working at a company to work with everybody, learn from everybody how they are using portfolios and therefore influence also the um, further development of the software and seeing the directions in which portfolios are taken in many different contexts. Of course, we are working quite a bit in education. However, in more recent years, also uh, employers and associations have been or have started to shift their portfolios around competency assessment into the electronic sphere so that we are also seeing more possibilities there, which then, of course, also helps with lifelong portfolios. So now let's take a look at what sort of portfolios we are actually talking about when we are looking at Mahara. If you're taking our learner, and because Mahara was initially developed as a personal learning environment, learners are always in the center of the attention. In the learning management system, it is often the teachers and the managers, because it is called management system, and students can uh, perform tasks or participate in activity as long as a teacher has set them up. However, in Mahara, the learner decides themselves what they want to do and what they also want to share. There are many different ways of how you can approach portfolios. So one of them is as a learning portfolio. So there you document your learning, things that you've learned um, in, a, in one seminar, things you've learned in the next one, and how you progressed from one learning experience to the next. Such a portfolio doesn't always have to be shared with uh, somebody else. It can just be for yourself and um, is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on your learning and really put the learning into, into the focus. Those portfolios then definitely have a huge reflective element, but also the other types of portfolios have a reflection because that is the nature of portfolios that you should have a reflection in there. A second very popular type of portfolios is the assessment portfolio. 
As the name already suggests, it is used for assessment or evaluation purposes and students are required to create a portfolio, reflect on their learning, then submit it for assessment, which is often done with the LMS. So Mahada does come with integrations into learning management systems. These days typically via LTI and Moodle also has an extra plugin available that makes it easier to assess portfolios directly from the comfort of your normal assignment activity. In recent years, more and more study programs now use work integrated learning um, so that students have internships or externships or practicums, which of course is nothing new for some other study programs like um, becoming a teacher. Whereas different, um, different departments that haven't yet used it do see the advantage of also bringing the practical world into studies so that then, of course, the question is, how can the university keep track of what the student is doing on their internship while they are away from the university? So that's then where a portfolio can come in really nicely because students can log their activities. They can reflect on what they have been learning in the company that they are working at. They could also even invite their workplace mentors to comment and provide feedback, or it could just be a portfolio for the learner as well as then a, an educational supervisor. With the work integrated learning portfolio, the students can stay in touch with the university or any other tertiary where they are studying, allowing also the tutor to keep, keep a bit of track of their students and help them if needed, if they notice that uh, they might be struggling somewhere or also um, encourage them and give them positive feedback. One portfolio that many of you will probably already have heard is the showcase portfolio. Um, it is often called presentation portfolio. And um, in that portfolio, of course, we want to show off our best self. So typically you use that for employability purposes, for example, so that you can show off what you're really good at. But instead of only having a curriculum vitae, you actually also put evidence in. But not just the evidence, you also reflect on that learning so that the employer or potential employer can then also see what you're good at, what you have been learning, how you have grown in your role in order to get a better idea of how you work and how you learn. Now leaving a bit more of that educational context, um, there are also increasingly, as I mentioned earlier, professional certification portfolios that are being done electronically. These are often based um, on competency frameworks. And in the past, these frameworks often just required that a, ticks box, uh, a tick was made against the competency and that was deemed sufficient. However, the associations realized, well, that does not always add much to the professional development uh, of their staff or of their association members. And therefore realized that in order to be a reflective practitioner or to become a reflective practitioner, the reflection is an important aspect and should therefore be included along, if possible, also with evidence of what has been learned in order to situate the learning and also the reflection. So all of these five types and you can give them different names and there can also be more types of portfolios depending how how very granular you want to get. But if you're looking at our five types, the learning portfolio, assessment portfolio, work integrated learning portfolio, showcase portfolio and professional portfolio, they are not always just standing on their own. Um, oftentimes you don't really find just one portfolio type, but there can be elements from another portfolio type in there. 
So for example, a professional certification portfolio often resembles an assessment or evaluation portfolio because some, somebody does take a look at it and decides whether you're competent or not. And then in a an, an assessment portfolio, you might also include the same evidence that you have in the learning portfolio, just with maybe a slightly different reflection to suit the assessment task. You may also include an assessment portfolio component in your showcase portfolio to demonstrate what you have learned. So while we have different types of portfolios, often there is some overlap. And what I really like about Mahara is that you can decide what type of portfolio you create. We are not just suggesting that there is one type, but you can have as many portfolios in your account as you wish therefore can be very flexible what you want to document where and also what you want to share with somebody else. Now, so much for part one of the theory and what you can do with it. And I find that it is always very helpful to look at some examples. If you'd like to see the examples that I'm showing to you um, in, its in, in their entirety, please do feel free to click the link in the shared notes um, because there you will see the examples that are publicly available. The first example here, and please do not worry that the text is very small. You're not supposed to read all of that at the moment. I will be pulling out individual words. Um, but, uh, but I want to show you this example because it exemplifies really, really nicely how we can use the language of reflection in a way to convey that we are writing a portfolio. This portfolio here is by Teresa McKinnon, who was a language educator at the University of Warwick. She's now retired and can um, do all the different activities to her heart's content. She is still teaching quite a bit and participating in European projects and is still very, very active in the community. You might be seeing her online or might already be following her. So she created a portfolio to become a certified member of the Association of Learning Technologists. And this portfolio here that you see the CMALT review is actually her second portfolio in order to still stay certified. In her portfolio, Teresa directly shows us that she is creating a portfolio and not just collecting evidence and giving us all that evidence. So what she says, for example, is that a highlight of my professional career was. So she is focusing on one learning experience on one particular event instead of showing us everything and making us wonder, well, what was an important event? What might not have been as important? So while we do suggest to people to collect a lot, maybe even everything in a portfolio, in the portfolio space and reflect on it, that does not mean that all of that evidence and all of those reflections will actually end up in the portfolio because you are selecting what is most pertinent for a particular portfolio situation. She, in another part of her portfolio says, the point at which I realized, again, she is pointing to one particular thing. She is not telling us everything, but drawing our attention to an important, maybe even pivotal um, moment in her professional career. Portfolios are big due to the fact that we reflect and look back at what we have done, why we have done it and how we might want to improve it or what we want to keep from our experience. She revisited um, each of the sections of her original CMALT submission in order to then see what is important, what might have changed, what she might want to mention in her CMOD review. 
since learning does not take place in a vacuum around us, just within ourselves, but within learning communities, uh, Teresa makes it very clear that she received feedback and mentoring, which was helpful, which then also influenced her learning, influenced her thinking. All of these elements, all of these little phrases that you see here, I find really show very well of what you can do with a portfolio and what is the importance of the portfolio. Namely, that you select, that you think back and think also forward in order to see what you might want to do differently. The second example here is from Brianna, um, a student at Monash University in Australia. She's a media student and in this portfolio or this portfolio is created for as for an assignment um, that is being assessed. What she still does as a as a media student then is be creative with her portfolio. She applied a skin, she used imagery, she used alignments of her text, different fonts and font sizes in order to express herself which of course is um, very important in media studies. And if you go to her portfolio, every page looks different. Um, there are different skins applied and she reflects on her experiences besides also writing short summaries. Last year, I had the opportunity to speak with Brianna about her portfolio experience. So you will find that link to that interview also in the shared notes if you'd like to listen to her and also other students who created portfolios. Another example here is the one from Karasina who is a student at Dublin City University. She also used a skin in her portfolio, um, a very subtle one, um, just using a different accent color and in her, portfo her portfolio is very straightforward, it is very structured, yet it still brings in her personality and it um, makes it very welcoming. She uses a number of images to also guide us through her portfolio. Looking at the headings in her portfolio, to me it looks like she has been using a template uh, to talk about the mentorship program that she was involved in. However, it doesn't really feel like a template, um, if it were indeed a template, because of how she presents the content, how she still brings in images and also the skin so that she can still individualize her portfolio. That is a very big and important aspect I find of portfolio work because portfolios do convey who we are and how we also want to be portrayed and um, what we want to show off. Often, of course, in a professional certification portfolio, that is not so much the case because these portfolios are often very straightforward and extremely structured. Um, also often don't contain a lot of um, images, at least the portfolios that we are involved in mainly in the healthcare sector so that there is not creativity is not a um, is not a criteria whereas for students uh, talking about their learning experience it often can be and it can actually also be part of a rubric if you are assessing portfolios this next portfolio here by Mark, also from Dublin City University, is not available online anymore, so I only have the screenshot for you. But I did want to leave it in here. Um, he is one of the recipients of this year's Dublin City University Student Portfolio Showcase um, and Awards, which is a fantastic um, opportunity for students to show off their portfolios, share them amongst their community and also um, inspire other learners of maybe trying something new in their portfolios. So Mark as, Mark's portfolio, as you can see, is very, very visual. He works with a lot of images. The, the colorful ones in the middle of the screen were actually also animated. So he works with 
the the heading very big and if you have already been using Mahara you might wonder how did he do that well actually he is applying a skin the only thing is that the skin is white text for the heading for the page heading on a white background so if you're looking at Karasinas this is the text that he turned white and he also made the header white so that the text is not visible to somebody looking at the screen. However, if you were on the page, you could highlight the text. So that is also a cool, cool way of bringing in visuals into the portfolio, yet also keeping it accessible because all the navigation elements that um, somebody who uses a screen reader requires are still available. So it's just one really nice example of um, him working with his portfolio, playing with it, using his uh, skills, use looking at the design of things and then making it his own. Now briefly back to some theory, because what we've seen so far is that you can use portfolios in a number of different um, for a number of different learning scenarios we've seen a few examples and now how how does it all tie together and that is where i think the definition of folio thinking uh, that helen chen from stanford university uh, developed comes in really really nicely the idea of folio thinking um, ties everything together. And here is um, a quote from Vicky Suter, who explains it very well with words that I highlighted for you to see the immediate connections we have to portfolios. So folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. So we've got collection, organization, reflection, connection, tell stories and relationships in there. So what you can see here then is what was demonstrated in Teresa's portfolio, for example, with the uh, phrases that I highlighted is that she's collected all her learning experiences, she's organized them, but then drew things out and only reflected on a few that were most pertinent. She also made connections between, say, her first portfolio and her second portfolio, so between the experiences um, sometime earlier and the one that she is reporting on now. And they are all in their portfolios telling their story. Karasina, for example, told the story of the mentorship program that she was involved in. Uh, Priyana told the story of um, her mom and other people that she interviewed for her journalism degree. And through that storytelling, do we get to know the students? Do we know who they are, what is important to them. And it is not just a multiple choice test um, where they study, the, study for the answers and then probably forget them quite quickly. But these stories stay with them. They learn from them. And we are also connecting these experiences with each other, relating them to each other, as well as also relate to other people. Um, whom we are giving access to the portfolios. So to kind of distill that for Mahara, I find that we have five main activities. In Mahara itself, we use three words, uh, create, share, engage. But kind of um, I'd like to subdivide some of them a little bit more to make it more granular uh, to, to guide people a bit more. And so the first C is create. 
typically when you look at a portfolio, the, um, the, the creation of the evidence um, happens before you actually get into the portfolio. However, I'd like to include create as one of the Mahara activities because you can create content directly in the portfolio platform. Then, of course, you collect, for the most part, your learning evidence, be that in the format of files or links to other websites. Or um, iframes that you embed or things that you download and then upload into your portfolio. So that is the entire evidence collection. Then the most crucial activity I find for portfolios is curate. And that is the organization and also the reflection on your learning evidence. Because if you think of somebody working in a museum, a curator who needs to put together an exhibit, they do not put all the artifacts that they have at the museum or maybe also in neighboring museums into a collection. They carefully select according to the theme and according to what they want to convey and then write a catalog. Um, explain the story, why all of these artifacts work together, what ties them together, what holds them together in order to help us make sense of that collection. And that's kind of, I find, also what we are doing in the portfolio. While we are collecting everything, we are still deciding when we create one particular portfolio, what is actually important in there? What do we want to showcase? What do we want to highlight? And why do we want to highlight that? Now we've seen in the folio thinking definition also that connections and relationships are important. And so that is what Mahara can uh, support us with. We can converse with others. We can invite their feedback. We can open up the portfolios to them. And while we can leave feedback directly in a portfolio, what we've also learned uh, from, from nurses, for example, is that they often do have a conversation either remotely or face-to-face -face about the portfolio before a comment is left. So using electronic portfolios does not have to mean that everything just happens online. You can still have personal conversations that then maybe just get summarized in a comment. Last but not least, you can also connect with other people by using groups in Mahara. So you can share files, you can use discussion forums, and you can also set up group portfolios, therefore collaborating on a project and reflecting as a group on that. So these are my five main Mahara activities create, collect, curate, converse, and connect. And the connect activity was donated by a, a learning designer from AUT a number of years ago when I talked about these activities first. And um, it is a welcome addition because we should not forget the group portfolios and what you can do in them. They are an integral part of Mahara. So if you now got interested to learn more, I invite you to subscribe to our brand new podcast. It is called aptly Create, Share, Engage, Portfolios for Learning and More. The first episode with Lisa Donaldson, who used to work at Dublin City University and start the portfolio initiative there, was aired on the 28th of September this year. So we are still brand new. And since then, we've published a couple more episodes with one coming next week as well. So episodes are, pub uh, um, are published every other week. And the podcast is available on all major podcast apps. If you don't yet use a podcast app, you are also very welcome to listen at podcast.mahara.org itself. 
And in that podcast, we share the stories of organizations, how they, uh, how they got started with the e-portfolios, what interested people, be that practitioners, academics, uh, researchers, students. I've also already interviewed one of my colleagues who is supporting organizations in their implementation. So all we, we are looking at all the different components of portfolio work. And every week you have a pretty short episode, just about 20 to 35 minutes, um, which you can learn more how people use portfolios and maybe also get inspired a little bit to try something out yourself or maybe also get in touch with them to discuss a project or uh, learn more beyond what they have been able to share in the uh, interview. There are also a lot of free resources available besides all the many books that have been written on portfolios over the years. Again, you can find the links to these resources in the shared notes. And once you get uh, the presentation slides, you will also be able just to click on the images there. The first free resource is that I'd like to share is the Digital Ethics Principles in ePortfolios um, created by the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force, of which I've been a member now for the last three years. There we are looking at establishing principles around digital ethics that should be kept in mind when creating portfolio activities and also when learners create their portfolios in order to be respectful to others um, and support each other. The Field Guide to ePortfolio is also a publication by ABEL that um, is more or less an executive summary. You kind of think with around 120 pages, that's quite a long executive summary, which is true. But uh, in the 12 chapters that are in that Field Guide, there are a ton of resources, a long bibliographies, and the chapters themselves, they are pretty short, typically between three and five pages, so that they can be consumed quite easily and you get an overview of what you might want to consider when implementing portfolios or seeking more arguments why you'd like to continue your portfolio initiative or just want to learn more in, um, in an area that you have not yet explored. The next two resources that I'd like to share with you are around portfolio assessment. They are both edited by Lisa Donaldson and share case studies from organizations around the UK and Ireland in particular in the top one and in the bottom one she's looking particularly at Dublin City University colleagues uh, who have been using portfolios in many different disciplines. So it's uh, also a very short, um, they are both very short reads, really, really good to have quick overviews of how portfolios are used. The portfolio um, page, Designing Effective ePortfolio Activities, was created by my colleague Sam Taylor in Catalyst um, um, in, in the UK and as a wonderful resource for being creative with introducing portfolios either for students or also for staff and have, getting some ideas of how that can be done and how much fun it can also be. Last but not least, a roughly 40 page publication is around the learning portfolio in higher education, a game of snakes and ladders. Again, a publication by Dublin City University that looks specifically at the learning portfolio and offers also a, an extensive bibliography on the topic. There are, of course, many, many more free resources around. And so these are just some of the highlights that I wanted to share with you because they are on the shorter side to read, yet are rich in content and give you a wonderful um, view into particular areas of portfolios. 
Now, if you're already using portfolios, um, we just released Mahara 22.10, where we've made a number of UX and internal changes. And as I said uh, before the recording started, you will receive the link to the recording because the earlier today was the last webinar that we had on it, but I'll definitely share the recording with you as well. If you'd like to get in touch with me and have any questions that you don't want to ask right now, then you are very welcome to contact me either via email or on social media so that we can then have a chat about your portfolios and um, what you're doing with them or what you'd like to be able to do.